announcements before we start. The first one is that uh, we will mute you after the meeting starts. So if you, uh, if you want to, at the end, when we have questions and comments, be, be sure you unmute yourself because um, we will mute you if you forget to, you know, mute yourself. Or of course, if you haven't gotten here yet, it will mute you when you come in, you don't know this announcement, but, um, uh, and I also wanted to welcome all of our new members. So Laura, I'm gonna actually let you give the official new member welcome, if you would please, and let us know who's on the call, who's new. Okay, well, we're- A new member. I should, I'm sorry, who's a new well, member? And then I'm also gonna welcome guests and we have a special um, introduction as well. I'm gonna introduce our intern. Okay, um, the new member that I see at this moment is Kelly Edmondson. Uh, we've had one new member every week in January, and we expect that to pick up. So welcome, Kelly. Um, Jean Ann is my um, partner in crime in the membership of while Donna is on her vacation in Arizona for the month. So Jean Ann did get in touch with Kelly. And those of you who are committee chairs, um, Jean Ann will be updating that welcome spreadsheet so that you um, can read about not only um, their conversation of, between Jean Ann and Kelly, but also um, uh, we've had, as I said, three other new members and you can you know, see who's joined and see what their background is and whether maybe it's someone you wanna contact for your committee that you think it might be a good spot for them or somewhere they can use their talents. So welcome, and we're hoping that Rory will become the next new member. She's, <laughs> yep. And Anne's going to welcome her as a visitor. And I've already conferred with her in the chat, Anne. I've got her email and let her know how she can join. So go Excellent. for it. All right. So uh, yep, and welcome to any other guests who we have visiting. I don't see anyone else, but if I've missed anyone, I welcome. Uh, also. Uh, and then Judy Ann, if you would like to introduce our intern real quick, if or I, I can, if you'd prefer. Yes, very, very thrilled. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Wonderful to see everyone be here and to have the honor of introducing Anna Bruce. Yay to our uh, organization, to our social media team in particular. She is a senior graduating this year from the Kansas City Art Institute and she joins us in a three month internship to um, feature her design to grow in social media and to give our team a lot of best practices in general for graphic design and just share her amazing talent. So we welcome her, I will put some links to her work already. She hit the ground running um, <laughs> in, in the chat. Anna, do you wanna say hello for a sec? Yeah, um, I just, thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be a part of uh, the internship program. Um, I'm having so much fun so far, I'm learning a lot. Um, I've met some really great ladies so far, but yeah, thank you for the warm welcome. I'm so excited to continue uh, working with everyone. Thank you. Well, welcome. And thank you, Anna. Thank you, Judy Ann. Um, and uh, now I'd like to begin our program because we have a whole lot to cover. There is a lot going on at the State House uh, right now. It's a little crazy and it's all happening fast. So without further ado, I am going to um, let everybody share the screen so that all of our presenters oops, can show us what they need to show us. And, um, ooh, Crystal, can you help me with that? I'm not, I, I think know I got it. You got it? I Thank think, you. I think I got it. Oh, okay. Thank you, Rachel. So without, for, without further further ado, I will introduce Rachel Thompson, who we were all chatting with earlier, but um, who is going to talk about how a bill through, moves through the General Assembly in Missouri. Hello, hello. Um, 
I am Rachel, as Anne said. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen here, which you can hopefully all see. I'm going to turn it into a slideshow. And someday when my computer works as fast as I want it to, there we go. Um, alrighty, so we, uh, I am just opening this up with a little bit of an intro on how a bill becomes a law. So like what the actual intricacies of the process are, uh, because there might be a little bit more to it than you would expect. I'm also going to tell you where we exactly can plug in and make the most difference. Um, okay. So the first thing that happens with any bill is that a bill gets filed. It um, will be, sometimes it'll be pre-filed if it's written and ready to go before the session starts. So pre-filing starts uh, the December before the session. Um, and then when once the bill is filed, the next step is that a bill has to have its first reading. And the first reading is scheduled by whoever is in charge of whichever particular chamber, i.e. the House or the Senate, that this bill is coming into first. If that bill is never scheduled for a first reading, the bill is considered dead and it never moves on from there. There's no reviving it, anything like that. It can, you know, it can be a couple of months before it gets its first reading and then it's fine. But if it never gets past that first step, uh, and you'll find that that happens a lot throughout this process. If at any point, the bill doesn't proceed to the next step, which is generally at the by the will of the majority party who sets the calendar for these things, the bill will no longer move forward. So the bill will have its first reading. And the history of readings is interesting to me. Uh, so readings started back in parliamentary England when the majority of elected officials <laughs> weren't there it still. And so they would have to read the bill aloud so that folks would know what they were actually voting on and debating. So we've kind of kept with that process. Every bill goes through three readings generally. That's the expected amount now. Um, and it's more, they don't read the full bill out because as you well know, many bills are multiple, multiple pages long, and that would take a lot of time. So generally, it's just you read the title, and then it is considered introduced into um, the legislature. So once it goes through the first reading, then you will have the second reading, and it will be assigned to a committee. Again, this is done when the um, leadership of the of the chamber decides that it wants to be done. The committee that it will be assigned to is generally related to what type of bill it is. So for example, if you have a bill about voter ID requirements, that bill will likely first be assigned to the elections committee because that's the committee that deals with those types of laws. So then next is our time to shine um, because what happens first in these committees is that there's a public hearing. This is our first real chance where we can have an impact, make our voices heard. And it's honestly, it's quite easy to do. So public hearings happen. There's a schedule that comes out um, that I know we're going to keep you updated on. And it's very easy to submit testimony online, at least in the House. I think in the Senate, it's a little bit wonkier, but at least in the house, it is incredibly easy. Um, I know I did it this past week. There were a couple of bills up um, in hearing on Wednesday and on Monday, I just went online, clicked the little link, um, typed in my testimony and it was a very easy process. And I felt good about being able to make my voice heard. Then after the public committee public hearing happens in the committee, that committee will vote on the bill. That's another time that we can have an impact. You want to call the members of the committee because, you know, maybe your uh, personal, your legislator is on the committee, which would be great, 
um, because they will definitely be responsive to their constituents. But either way, it's important to call those members of the committee to to make your voice heard. Uh, and then once if it passes through the committee vote, the bill is sent back to the original chamber. And then it is set on the calendar for what is called perfection, which is when the full house, for example, debates the bill, says, oh, we want to add this one or the other thing. We want to change something about it. And they decide what is the final perfected form of this bill that they're going to then eventually vote on. And they're still not voting on it yet because once the bill has been perfected, then we have this third reading. Again, just a formality, we're not reading the whole bill. And then we get the actual vote in the first chamber, which is another chance for us to make our voices heard. This especially, you're calling your legislator, telling them how you want them to vote on the bill. Um, and once we have this vote in the first chamber, then the bill has to undergo the same exact steps in the other chamber. So for example, if you have this bill on voter ID laws and it's gone through the house, it's gone into the committee assignments, it's passed through the, through the committees, it's passed the house vote, it has to go to the Senate now. And then the Senate will again introduce it, assign it to a committee. It will have to go through that committee, pass out of the committee, go back to the full Senate, and go for a vote in the Senate. And it's possible then that it gets a little bit funky because so in the simplest form, the Senate will pass that bill and it's just it is form that the House passed the bill and then it's we're all hunky dory, everyone's happy, no one has to fight about anything. But if the Senate adds amendments or makes other weird changes, then we get to a point where that bill has to be sent back to the other chamber to see if they will accept this new form. If they can't agree, then you have this conference committee that convenes, which is basically like a mediation session. You have members from the House and the Senate, both on the committee. They come to an agreement, though the agreement for that bill gets sent back to both um, chambers. Eventually, if it is passed, we get to this final stage where the bill is considered truly agreed and finally passed. I love these weird phrases that they use for things. And then it's still not a bill yet, or it's still not a law yet. It's a bill. It's not a law yet because the bill then gets sent to the governor and the governor can do three things. The governor can either sign the bill, ignore the bill or veto the bill. And if the governor signs or ignores the bill, the bill becomes law. If the governor vetoes the bill, um, both chambers have the opportunity to override that veto, but you have to have a two thirds majority vote in both chambers in order to override that veto. So once the bill becomes a law, the last step is the law is sent to the secretary of state because the secretary of state is the one who keeps track of our laws and has to put it into our like legal codes. Um, and that's really the final step to getting it to being a law that is practiced and upheld within, uh, within the U.S. So, or not, well, not the U.S., but Missouri, at least for us. So I want to just uh, go, there we go, go back to just highlight again these two really important points where we can have an impact is when it's when these bills are in the committee because we think of our legislators often as kind of this monolith within a huge house or the whole senate and it's kind of hard to think of how you as one individual could have an impact on such a giant group of people but when you get people down into committees committees can be anywhere from like five or six people up to like 30 odd people, but still that's a much smaller number. And hearing from individuals in those committees is gonna have an impact. Um, so we're gonna be able to give you the tools that you need to very, very easily take action in these specific places. 
Um, and I think that is it for me. Um, I don't think I'm taking questions now. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna hand it off. No, we'll do questions after. Thank you, Rachel. Um, that is so helpful for us to know how, uh, how the bill goes through. It is more complicated than I thought. <laughs> um, all right, and I would next like to welcome Denise Lieberman, who is uh, the, the leader of the Missouri uh, Voter Protection Coalition, who um, just works tirelessly to protect everyone's right to vote in Missouri. And she's gonna talk about uh, specific legislation that has been introduced in the General Assembly and where that legislation is and what we can do about it. So welcome, Denise. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, everybody. It's so great to be here. Thank you, Rachel, for that great presentation. Uh, and, and now you know um, the, how you can submit testimony. And in fact, there are some uh, hearings coming up this week on voting bills that I think we all care about that um, you can put some of those tips to immediate practice right away. I'm going to share my screen because I know I only have 10 minutes and I'm Anne's going to take that big uh, <laughs> virtual <laughs> hook and, and pull me off if I don't stop by then. <laughs> um, so many of you know me. I'm the head, the director and general counsel of the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. We're a nonpartisan a statewide network of advocates who work to protect the freedom to vote in Missouri um, through these four buckets of work, policy advocacy. We uh, lead um, we're the umbrella organization that tracks uh, legislation affecting access to the ballot in Missouri um, for all of our partner organizations and helps provide analysis, talking points, and tools so that you can weigh in and testify easily. Um, and this is part, you know, this is something that we'll, that we do in coordination with all of our partners. There are currently about 60 affiliated uh, partner organizations with the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. But this is all part of a bigger coordinated effort. We also engage in legal advocacy and strategic litigation, often in partnership with the League of Women Voters. Um, voter education and engagement, which is so, so, so very critical and a role that the league has taken a tremendous leadership role on. And um, our signature service program is coordinating nonpartisan election protection efforts, taking those educational tools, putting them in the hands of volunteer monitors at the polls who are there assisting voters in real time with a net hotline where you call and speak immediately to, in real time to a lawyer from Missouri. This combined effort helps ensure that no voter has to leave a polling place without casting a ballot on election day. And the league has also been a leader in helping coordinate those efforts. In fact, you can see here, the league um, has typically uh, been on the front lines challenging discriminatory voting laws in Missouri. The league was the plaintiff in litigation to help ensure all voters could safely cast ballots amid the pandemic. Uh, and here's a, a, a fun photo, actually, while we were at trial on that on uh, the last time we had to go to court to fight the photo ID laws. This was in 2019. And the league is such an important leader because of the credibility you bring to the space. And, and that's why I really want to urge your participation in these upcoming hearings because lawmakers trust what you have to say. Because at the end of the day, I'm reminded of this quote from Martin Luther King in the Give Us the Ballot speech. This is not as much as the news makes it about Democrats versus Republicans. The fight for the right to vote is about something much bigger. It's about basic human dignity, recognizing the value that each person brings to the political market space. I mean, of course, the league was born out of that fight. The league was born out of the fight for women's suffrage. And so that's why that guiding principle is something that as an organization, you help set the narrative on these issues uh, in a way that really takes them out of the, um, the, the realm of, of overt partisanship to really being about something that is inherently a fundamental right that all of us enjoy. And we know that that right is under attack 
the big lie that led to the January 6th insurrection, that led to the spate of restrictive voting laws across the country last year that are targeting our most marginalized citizens, communities of color, seniors, low-wage workers, young voters, voters with disabilities, unlike nothing we have seen since the Jim Crow era. And that is why we have been fighting to secure federal voting protections. Um, many of you participated in our efforts here in Missouri uh, in, that included Congressman Cleaver um, to call for national voting legislation in the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. The Freedom to Vote Act would have instilled um, minimum national standards to protect the right to vote, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act would have restored protections of the Voting Rights Act that allow us to strike racially discriminatory voting laws. Combined, these measures would have been a game changer in Missouri, which is already so far behind states around the country. Unfortunately, we all know what happened. These measures came to a vote despite that the bills had support of a majority in the United States Senate. There wasn't a majority, there were two votes short of changing the rules of the filibuster this allowed a minority of the Senate to block the ability to vote on these bills. And this has been done historically to block civil rights legislation. But this fight is not over. What we know is that because these bills have stalled in Congress, our fight here in the state is all the more critical, all the more important. We have to come together right now to ensure that people have the right to vote in 2022, to ensure that people are registered to vote and don't face undue barriers to the ballot. That's hard in a place like Missouri, where our own chief elections official has pointed to Texas as a, as, as a glowing model for the state of Missouri. Texas, which is known to have enacted the worst voter suppression law in the country last year. So here are the three things that we're facing in Mo Ledge right now, or that I, I'm gonna, there's more than three. I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly tell you about three um, that affect the right to vote. Photo ID, a tax on the citizen initiative process, and a tax on voting by mail. They're a little bit confusing, purposely so I'll suggest. First, a tax on the citizen initiative process. Many, many of you have been following um, uh, these efforts, the legislature convened the first week of January and was full steam ahead with uh, hearings every single week on uh, uh, nearly a dozen bills that would attack the citizen initiative process in Missouri. This is a process that goes back more than 100 years. Uh, it allows direct citizen participation in the Democrat process. If you've got a great idea, uh, for a law and your representative and senator is not listening and advancing that idea, if you get enough other citizens to think that people should vote on it, you can get it put on the ballot. And if a majority of people in the state agree that it's a great idea, it becomes law. It's not quite that simple, but that's the idea of the process. Um, it's, it's already pretty hard. You have to get a lot of other registered voters from across most of the state to agree that this is something we should consider before it can get put on the ballot now. But once you get it on the ballot, if a majority of people vote for it, it becomes law. These bills that are pending now, and again, there's about a dozen of them, would make this process harder, nearly impossible for all but the wealthiest of funded efforts in two ways. One, it would make it harder to place a measure on the ballot by increasing the signatures advocates would have to get. Second, it would make it harder to pass. Once on the ballot, instead of passing by a majority vote, most of these bills would mandate a two thirds threshold, 66%. This is a very high threshold. What that means is that measures that are supported by the vast majority of Missourians would still not pass muster. Think about Medicaid expansion. Over 60% of Missouri's voters wanted that. That would not be enough to pass muster. By the way, that's one reason we're seeing these bills. But we're seeing these bills around the country. This is part of a concerted attack that mirrors attacks we're seeing in states around the country. So the bill that is furthest along 
is HJR 79. I was in the, the, the Capitol this Thursday when it came to a floor vote. Um, I got to give a shout out to Representative Trish Gumby, who on the floor actually read testimony from many of you. She read testimonies that people submitted to the House Elections Committee when these bills came up for a committee hearing. So these even when you think that the votes are stacked against you, your testimony makes a difference. Her speech on the floor was incredibly compelling. The media was there covering that. It helped frame and change the narrative. So your testimonies mean something, even though this bill did pass out of the House on Thursday. It's now been first read in the Senate. And again, just like I mentioned, this bill does the two things that I mentioned, it requires more signatures to get on the ballot, probably several hundred thousand more signatures. If any of you have ever collected signatures for uh, an initiative or anything, you know that if you get like 15 in an hour, or 20 in an hour, you're doing pretty good. So several hundred thousand additional signatures is a lot and increasing the threshold to pass to nearly impossible levels. But there's a whole bunch of these other bills that are also quickly moving their way up. Um, it looks like 79 is the, is the vehicle, but it could really be any of these other initiative petition bills that all do close to the same thing. Second, photo ID. The League of Women Voters has been a plaintiff in like how many photo ID law uh, challenges now? I, you know, we keep coming back. This is now year 16 that we've had to come back. Um, lawmakers are yet again attempting to enshrine discriminatory photo ID requirements to vote. What these bills would do is this, eliminate non-photo forms of ID that voters can currently use to vote and have come to rely on, like the voter registration card that you get from the election authority that the election says the election authority has verified that you are in fact a valid registered voter entitled to vote in that election. What could better verify your eligibility to vote in that election other than that card? And people use it because it's incredibly helpful. It tells you when election day is, it comes right before election day. It tells you where your polling place is, which is really helpful if it's changed. It tells you what time the polls are open. It's Many of them have a little bar card. The election authorities can scan it. It also eliminates things like a student ID from a Missouri college or university. The bills that are moving this right now that, that are at least getting a hearing, again, there's lots of bills that have these provisions in it. House Bill 1878 and House Bill 2113. What happens it, when you eliminate these non-photo forms of IDs is that you're basically left with the kind of ID that you have to get at the DMV and it has to be non-expired. And that's where the problems come in. And that's why there are over 200,000 valid Missouri voters that don't have a non-expired state ID on file with the Missouri Department of Revenue. Disproportionately seniors whose IDs might be expired. They can use those. My mom has a, an expired driver's license that works just fine. If she has to go to the bank, if we have to go to the doctor, anything like that. It eliminates those student IDs, right? And what we know is that when you limit the forms of ID to the kind you have to get at the DMV, you leave people out. Not all counties in Missouri even have a DMV. DMV offices are pseudo private franchisees. Um, they're, they carry out a state function, but they don't have to follow um, state mandates. For example, they couldn't mandate that staff be trained on giving people photo IDs. So many of these offices are not open evenings or weekends, making it difficult for hourly wage workers or shift workers, many of these essential workers that have kept us healthy over the pandemic. Many are not accessible on public transportation routes because they're used to dealing with drivers. And that's before you get to the underlying documents like a certified birth certificate that are necessary to get a state issued photo ID. Some people don't have those underlying documents at all. I've represented people who've been victims of natural disasters like Hurricane Katrina or tornado, the tornadoes in Joplin that hit a hospital just destroyed 
lots of people's underlying documents, or if you have errors in those underlying documents. It can be extremely difficult, even mandating going to court to get a court legal name change to correct a typo if there's a disparity between how your name is spelled on the birth certificate versus your driver's license versus your voter registration versus your social security. It can be incredibly burdensome. And for many people of color of a certain age, they were born during segregation, especially in the South. Their mothers were not welcome at local hospitals to give birth. The practice was typically to give birth at home with a midwife, no formal birth certificate. And for these folks to get a backdated birth certificate, again, is incredibly difficult. That is one reason that people of color are disproportionately impacted by these kinds of laws. And that's the other reason the Missouri Supreme Court has concluded that a strict photo ID requirement violates the Missouri Constitution. Um, there's the plaintiff. I like to show some photos because I think it helps to put a face on people. That's Kathleen Weinshank, who was the plaintiff in that case. With cerebral palsy, can't duplicate her signature, doesn't drive, doesn't have driver's license, right? Third, um, and by the way, um, here's the status. 1878 had a hearing this past Thursday. I was there testifying on it. HB 2113 is having a hearing this coming Wednesday. There's still time for you to weigh in on this photo ID requirement. The third is limits on voting by mail. These are included as pieces of several bills, including House Bill 2113, House Bill 2140, which are both being heard this coming Wednesday in House Bill 1455, which was heard last Wednesday. Um, here is the hearing notice. And Rachel talked about the ease of being able to submit testimony. Do you see that arrow there? In the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition's action alerts, we include these hearing notices with a link to that link right there. And we make it really easy. All you have to do is click on that link. The bills come up and you can submit your statement. The one thing I need to add to Rachel's presentation is once you submit a statement online, you will get a confirmation email. You must click the confirmation email. It's going to say confirm that this is in fact your email. You have to do that in order for your statement to actually get submitted. Also, you need to get your statement in at least one hour prior to the hearing time. This week's hearing is Wednesday, February 16th at noon. So you have to get this in before 11 a.m. The online porter will not accept your submission after 11 a.m. You can find it yourself at house.mo.gov slash all hearings. So here's what these would do, House Bill 2113 and 2140. Looks, it's one of these bills that looks sort of good at first, but when you pull back the curtain, it's got some problems. This bill would allow no excuse absentee voting in Missouri, which is great. We sorely need this. We are one of the few states that are, does not allow people to vote absentee without providing a reason. The vast majority of states allow anybody to vote absentee without providing a reason. Here in Missouri, you have to complete an application, it looks like this, listing one of these six limited reasons to vote absentee. And that's true whether you want to vote absent currently, whether you want to vote absentee by mail or absentee in person. What these bills would do is allow no excuse absentee voting. You don't have to provide a reason, but only for a subset of voters, only for people who are able to appear in person at the election office, which is typically only open during working hours, they're only required to be open on, on a Saturday right before election day. And only under House Bill 2113 with state issued strict photo ID. House Bill 2113 also says if the photo ID part of the law gets struck down, which we are going to file another lawsuit, 
hope you guys are ready to join us again. Then the whole no excuse absentee voting goes away. So you can kind of see that this is really a bit of a ruse already. No excuse absentee voting only for people who can appear in person. So think about who that leaves out. Who's not able to get to the election board office during working hours? People who are hourly wage workers, who the only way they can take off on a weekday is to take a day off without pay. Shift workers. People who lack transportation to the election office, elderly voters, voters with disabilities, people with chronic health conditions, people who have child or elder care obligations who can't get to that office and need to request those absentee ballots by mail, they would still have to meet one of those limited excuses. And guess what? Being over 65, having to work on election day, having a chronic health condition, alone, having a disability, unless you are completely confined alone, does not qualify you to get an absentee ballot. You would still not be eligible to vote absentee. These are the people that need absentee voting the most. These are the people who would be left out by this legislation. And even worse, House Bill 2113 actually makes it harder for the most marginalized folks. It would actually limit absentee voting for people who are confined due to illness or disability saying, oh, now you can only get an absentee ballot if you're actually confined on election day. So for people who have severe illnesses or who are disabled, but occasionally can get out, you're now out of luck. It would also prohibit caretakers of these folks from getting absentee ballots unless they actually live with the confined individual. I serve as a caretaker for my 90 year old mother. I'm there every single day, <laughs> most of the day. But I do come home at the end of the day after she goes, you know, after we get her ready for bed and I, you know, go to bed with my spouse. I don't live with her. I'm not registered to vote there. I would not any longer be eligible to vote absentee because of those caretaking obligations. It also prohibits helping people get absentee ballot applications or helping them fill out those applications. That's something the league has done and lots of other organizations have done. House Bill 1455 also makes it illegal to provide people with blank applications. That bill was heard last week. Finally, I just wanted to just give a note, the other bill that's being heard this Wednesday would um, Take us a little bit closer to eliminating Missouri's open primary process by requiring the registrar to record um, your political party selection during a primary election. That's also being heard this Wednesday. So we ask that you submit a statement, appear in person if you can, that's the best, but we understand lots of people can't. You can submit a statement online, at least in the House. In the Senate, they do require you to appear in person or have your testimony uh, delivered by um, by a proxy. Write a letter to the editor. It really helps change the narrative. Uh, and join us. The Missouri Voter Protection Coalition meets every Monday at 10 a.m. We give lots of updates on, on the bills that are happening. We hear from legislators. And uh, I'm going to stop because I think I went on way too long. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. Um, I'm going to put your the info at MOVPC, it's .org, right? I wanna put that in the chat so that um, everybody can sign up. If you're not already signed up to get the email from MOVPC, it, it's just chock full of information. And um, you, also I wanna shout out for the Monday morning meeting. Um, I know there are several of us on this, this call who are on the Monday morning meetings often, but there's a ton of information and um, we hear from some of our legislators about what's going on in the General Assembly and what the vibe is there and, and uh, tons of information about what we can do. So thank you so much, Denise. Uh, are you sticking around? Will we get to ask questions later? Excellent, thank you so, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, next, Reva is gonna talk about some social justice bills. So let me make it so that you can. And Anne, can I just say, I put that link in the chat. You all can copy it. It tells you how to get to the house.mo.gov 
forward yes. slash all hearings. And then I also put in that you look for that submit written testimony here. And then you have to confirm when you get the email um, confirmation that you've submitted. So you can just copy that right out of the chat and paste it into um, a browser or wherever else you want to go. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Reva. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for Mary, who is uh, supplying the uh, slides for this. I'm going to talk about two bills. This first one she has up uh, there, um, I decided to bring up because this is possibly going to be a bipartisan bill that we could support. This is the House bill that is sponsored by Ron Hicks who is a Republican. There is also a similar uh, Democratic bill uh, by Lauren Arthur, uh, Senate bill, sorry, uh, 936, that is similar uh, uh, wording. Uh, this bill, as you can see, has been read twice, uh, but back it's been back in January, so it's really not moving. However, um, I wanna keep track of it because this is a bill that hopefully will, um, fill in a loophole that was created last year when the um oh gosh what is that bill that uh provided uh our law office our law officials enforcement officials here in missouri are not able to enforce federal gun laws as one of those laws was to prohibit and criminalize domestic abusers from obtaining and possessing guns um, now they can because uh, it's not a Missouri law. So we're trying to get a Missouri law that says when you are charged with a domestic abuse uh, charge that between that time and your trial, you cannot have, it's criminal to have uh, a gun in your possession at this point in time. Uh, you can imagine how frightening that would be for someone who is a, an abused person to find out that their abuser can still possess a firearm even after they've been charged with domestic violence. Uh, so this bill, uh, HB 1655, and also the Senate bill are similar. Um, the important thing to remember about this bill is that there are some Republicans who are willing to uh, support this bill, including Senator Eric Burlinson, who's from, from Battlefield. If you are know of this, if yeah, I don't know if this person is even in our jurisdiction, but um, one of the senators, Bob Onder from uh, Louis, St. Louis, uh, it considers this a red flag law, which in my understanding means that uh, the NRA will take points away from you if you support this law. Uh, Ron Hicks has uh, has guaranteed us that this is not true, that the NRA does not consider this a red flag law. And I bring that up only because in the future, if this bill goes through or starts to move, we can use this as a talking point that this is not a red flag law. It does not really hinder uh, people, uh, the Second Amendment um, rights of people to own guns. It's only those people who should not have them that this law will affect. Uh, so we're watching it. Uh, like I said, it's not going anywhere at the moment, but this is a possible bipartisan law that might come out of this and something we can support. And so I think that's important. So Mary, the next slide, please. Um, yes. No, 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 uh, 117. Yes, thank you, there we go. Uh, you can see that from this slide, this bill has been voted out, uh, it's moving quickly. So it's on the House Joint Resolutions for Perfection. This doesn't mean that we can't do anything, it's just that it's out of committee now. And this is a very confusing bill because um, a lot of people, as you can see, uh, the 160 testimonies were marked in support, but some in error. Mary read through these. Some of these people felt like this actually uh, um, supported Medicaid expansion, but the bill actually allows the General Assembly to determine whether or not uh, the Medicaid expansion population, which are the people that would have gotten Medicaid if well, we voted for them to get Medicaid. However, the General Assembly can decide whether or not this group of people is actually eligible, and they do that by deciding whether or not they should, they're going to allocate funding for this group of people. 
they can basically not fund this group of people according to HJR, which is a House Joint Resolution 117. Um, go back, Mary. <laughs> We're not done. Uh, I know, I know. I'm, I, I just was trying to get in to say that I wrote that wrong. All those, those were all people in opposition, not in- Right, right. They were in opposition, but some of them uh, were, in oppos were actually supporting, right? Isn't that what you told me? They were actually supporting Medicaid expansion and they thought that's what this bill did. It does not support uh, Medicaid expansion. It does the opposite. So this is a, it's, it's very confusing the way that they have this written, but it basically means that if they don't allocate funding in that fiscal year for this population, those people will not be allowed and eligible for reimbursement through health net services. So this is really taking away um, Medicaid expansion from that particular population that we all wanted to have. Uh, you can see on the bottom 53% approval to um, expand Medicaid. Uh, so this, again, even though this bill um, is gone out of, uh, is, is on the perfection calendar, we can still continue to correspond with our legislators and tell them that we are really not only um, concerned about these people not getting their health services, but also that the, the basically what this bill says is that as voters, what we say does not matter because we've already voted in support of this. Um, I'm going to make it short because I know we're a little behind. So um, I don't know, Mary, if there's anything else you want to say to this. I just wanted to uh, say to our those on um, board here that we can continue to communicate with the legislators on this particular bill. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Reva. I appreciate that. We appreciate that. Um, next, we have Mary Lindsay, who's going to talk about some education bills. Mary, you're muted. Mary, you need to unmute for us, please. Okay, there I, you thought go. I, I thought I couldn't do it because, well, it doesn't matter why. Um, I am filling in, so to speak, uh, for the um, incomparable Dolores, who um, does all this research every year on education. And um, that as uh, I, th I think it was an Anitra said that she had a, a big, fall and has been injured and has also made it difficult for her to use her computer. Um, anyway, so this House Bill 1611, um, we are opposing. It would require that school board candidates declare a party. And obviously we all know from the news that school boards have become a really, really crazy hotbed of um, conflict and making people declare a party would serve really to make school board elections more partisan and more polarized. So that's that. There's another similar one. Um, that isn't what I'm going for. I don't know why. Yes, this one, it would move um, school board elections from April to November. And this one has moved on. The first one has only been read. No other action has taken place. But this one was read twice and went to the elementary and second. Their education committee was um, discussed, but um, hasn't moved on. And I don't know exactly why. Of the bills that I've looked at, in preparation for today, there are many, many that on the 8th um, were stopped. They, they, their action is postponed. Um, and this one also, this is another education bill. Um, and there, I, I do need to say, that there were like 120 education bills that were pre-filed 
before we even got into the um, session. And many of them dealt with critical race theory and, and all kinds of things, making, making our school situation more difficult. This one, as I said, uh, prohibits the teaching of critical race theory, even uses the term, but it was very broadly defined. And this bill also requires a, a parent's bill of rights, um, which would, I, I mean, I don't even know how a school could function with all the ways in which parents would need to be involved with basically every move they make. But this one was moving. Um, and this one I did write it correctly. At the public hearing of the testimonies that were submitted, um, over a thousand of them were submitted and the vast majority were strongly in opposition. So um, that is, but its action is postponed also. And so, you know, we will keep watching them because you never know what bill may somehow come to life and, um, and, and could move fast. So that's all for me now. And you're gonna be sharing slides for Annette, please. I am, thank you. So if you will stop sharing your screen, I will share mine. Oh yeah, there. Thank you. And let me go to play. Right. There you go, Annette. All right. Um, uh, wow. Can you go back? Oh, well, let me see. It's missing it. There we go. Okay. My topic is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And this uh, supports um, the power of the popular vote in the only election in our country that is not determined by the uh, popular vote, the presidential. So now the next slide, I'm gonna show you the presidential election, the past one. <clears throat> Everybody talks about how Biden won by 7 million votes. He actually only won by 22,856 votes spread out over three states. You flip those votes in those three states and he would have lost the election. So that's how close the election really was. And that's primarily what has caused all the chaos in, in this last year about voter fraud, because it's not that many votes. It's 22,856, not 7 million. The National Popular Vote Compact would change that. Okay, next slide. And that there is there, here it shows you. And what I like about this slide, it shows you the power of the voters in Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, states like that. It's much more, it's not one vote, one person. Their vote, their states are much more important to candidates. They spend 95% of their time in those states. I'm gonna show you the 10 states. And uh, in terms of promises, political promises, they don't go to a state like Missouri. So, okay, next slide. Okay, these were the 10. Nope. Uh, uh, you're going, you got to go back. We hope sorry, that sorry, this sorry, presentation sorry. wasn't. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, my presentation is already over. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I'm, there I'm we just go. These, these were the states that were most in play. And over the years, and I'm old enough to remember when Missouri was actually a swing state, and we got a lot of attention um, when we had maybe one Democratic, one Republican senator. We are not in play anymore. So that just gives you, and this has also changed. Colorado used to be in play, West Virginia, they're no longer. So the new players are Arizona and Georgia. So I just wanted to point that out. And you probably heard more about these 10 states than you ever wanted to hear about in your life. So, okay. So what is, next slide, what is the nat National Popular Vote Interstate Compact? What is a compact? A compact is just an agreement between states. And it can be two states like the bi-state transportation in uh, St. Louis and Kansas City, where we share uh, transportation systems with another state. Or it can be, my favorite is uh, Michael Steele's uh, uh, example of Powerball. That's a, that is an interstate compact between states to run a big lotter lottery system 
and that the proceeds, <clears throat> we agree in Missouri that if a winner comes up in Wisconsin, we agree that we will give our proceeds to them. That's all part of that compact. So those are the two best examples I have, but there's others. So uh, next slide, we're almost done. Let me show you where we are with the uh, National Popular Vote uh, Interstate Compact. We have a total now, and the way the compact is enacted is when we reach states that have a total of 270 electoral votes. These are the states in green that are already in the compact. Now, it isn't in play until we get an additional, if you look at the bottom the, in red, additional needed 75 popular votes, or electoral uh, college votes, I'm sorry, because this does not eliminate the electoral college. So if you can just look down those uh, list of states, um, starting I think in 2007 was the first few. So this has been going on a long time. So that's just for information. So well, that's it. That's all I had. And of course, this is supported in the, the presentation was developed by the League of Women Voters of Missouri. All right. Thank you very much, Annette. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you after, at the end on okay. that. Um, <laughs> About okay. my name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, we have Evelyn Maddox, who's going to talk about um, some police, Kansas City, Missouri police issues. Evelyn. Yes, hello. Thank you very much. And thank you to Mary um, Lindsay, who developed our slides. And um, Senate Bill 678 is particularly important to the residents of Kansas City, Missouri, because um, it would increase funding for the funding from our Kansas City revenues, from our Can the city of Kansas City budget. It would increase the funding from one fifth to one fourth of our city's revenue. And that would include all funds that come from taxes and fees and beyond the general revenue. And that means if any, any of our city agencies gets money from other than taxes, um, that money would have to be shared with the police department and which it is not, would not currently be shared. So there have been, uh, there has been a hearing and it's, it's even reached the Senate perfection calendar, okay. Uh, Mary's also noted how um, Kansas City's current proposed budget for the police department uh, is $269 million and that's $8 million over last year. So our city council has even increased the money that it would provide to the Kansas City Police Department. Uh, we, if this bill does not pass, um, uh, the money would already have been increased by our city council. Okay, and um, if if this passes, it would through our throw our Kansas City, our city of Kansas City, all right, budget into a budgetary crisis. Mary, is there a second slide? No, no, oh, okay. I think that's about all to be said about it. I do want to bring to your attention that in our in your member handbook for the Kansas City League, there is a specification that uh, a, a, a position, it is a, a position on the expenditures by our city of council, by our city council, and it says that public safety and protection and maintenance and utility are our highest priority. And this type of um, this type this difference, this increase in an allocation uh, from our city council's budget to the police department would threaten certain other city agencies. It would actually take money from them. So I believe that's all that needs to be said about this. Okay, thank you so much, Evelyn. And uh, yeah, thank you. So um, that is, those are our guests for today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit before we get to questions and answers. I want to talk a little bit about, so now we have this information. Uh, now what do we do? Um, so at, we have got, we have at the league and we have traditionally at the league had a legislative action committee and our legislative action committee is reforming, re-energizing as we speak. And so 
the Legislative Action Committee is going to go out and find out about these bills, track these bills, figure out what's going on at the State House, and bring that information back to you. That, that's what we've done traditionally, that's what we will continue to do. And we are lucky to have some new tools. We've got um, Google Workspace, we've got some, some things behind the scenes that we can use to uh, make that go a little bit more smoothly and to streamline a little bit. And we also have this incredible social media team who can get that information out quickly, turn it around quickly, um, make it very uh, catchy and easy to understand. They're very, very good at, at taking our many, many words and boiling them down into just the very most important words that you need to know. Um, we also have our newsletter team, that our e-voter team that can turn that information around. So, uh, so here's what we're going to ask of, of you, of our members. Once a week, we will have a legislative update that goes out via email. That legislative update will include three different levels of engagement. So if you are a busy professional or you've got um, obligations at home uh, or whatever, if you, are, if you are super busy and you have five minutes a week, five minutes a month even, but if you've got five minutes that you can devote to participating in our democracy, to making a difference, then we're gonna give you an option that we call Five for Democracy. So you can look for those Five for Democracy posts. We'll have a, a section in our weekly update, uh, our weekly email, legislative update email that says, here's your Five for Democracy, take action. And you can trust that the members of the Legislative Action Committee have vetted that information. And so it will be the very bare bones. We'd like you to call the, your representative and tell them to vote no or we'd like you to call the US Congress maybe, well, that's not legislative action per se, but we might throw that in. Um, tell them to vote yes for this or tell them to support that. So uh, it might be call, it might be tweet, it might be retweet, share, but it'll be something that'll take five minutes or less. Then we've got opportunities for people who won't have maybe 30 minutes to in become engaged with their uh, with democracy. So we're calling that the power play. And that's 30 minutes, roughly. We might ask you to learn more about what that is, is in this legislation. Look at the talking points. We might ask you to write your own social media post. We might ask you to call a friend and uh, start a conversation about what's going on. So something that will take more like 30 minutes. So we're going to call that the power play and we'll have that clearly marked and available for you to look at. We'll have links, we'll have talking points, we'll have just a little bit more information in those posts. And the final level is a deep dive. So a whole bunch of us, um, are maybe retired or maybe work part-time like I do and uh, might wanna devote you know, some hours to finding out more about what, oops, about what is going on in the legislature. We might have time to gather together with other supporters and, and drive to Jeff City and testify in front of the Senate because that's the only way you can testify at the Senate. We might write a letter to the editor. We might write testimony and submit it. So there are all kinds of ways in which we can take a deep dive. And so we will provide information in our, e, in our weekly newsletter that will let you take a deep dive. We'll have links to articles, to the, to the text of the legislation. We'll have links to the place where you can submit testimony and um, so we'll provide that for you. So that's what we're asking you guys to do is to not just come and find out about these, um, uh, about this legislation, these bills, because we know that that's useful. Uh, absolutely, that's useful. And in fact, we may have some red shirts, which uh, apparently is a football term. I'm not, you know, sports. So somebody told me that, but th that it's uh 
college football that you can sit on the bench and not lose your ele- okay i'm gonna get that wrong but here we're gonna mean it that you can support us by showing up at meetings by being a, a, one of our members you you are a part of our membership you can pay give us your dues which supports us financially and not participate so if that if that's you if you're if you're waiting you don't have a you don't have a time to jump in right now that's okay too you can be a red shirt um okay don't uh, no specifics about what the <laughs> I'm, I'm getting my brother is telling me exactly what a red shirt is i don't actually want to know <laughs> so uh but we want to have we want to provide all levels of engagement for the people who are in the league and we want to make it as easy as possible for you to participate and so um my congratulations, my uh, eternal gratitude to the Legislative Action Committee leaders who have pulled together in a, in a number of weeks and to social media leaders who've jumped in and to the newsletter who's jumped in. And we've all come together and brainstormed and, and come up with some ways that we think we can make it really easy for you to, um, to engage. So look for that, look for that, Um, weekly newsletter that's going to come out it'll be short it'll be just legislative action and it will come out starting the end of next week we don't promise what day it'll come out but we will do our best to get it out before Monday so that you can read about what's going on the week starting Monday so that you could take action Um, and then also Rachel and I uh, as many of you know produce a podcast we produce a podcast that is anywhere from 25 to to way too long (laughs) Um, on a monthly ish basis but we have just started doing a podcast that is five minutes or less once a week that is also here's what's coming up on the calendar for this week that you that needs your urgent attention so it won't be as many bills as we talk about in the legislation legislative action email um, but it will be the ones that are coming up that we need to really focus on. Um, then uh, there was something else I wanted to tell you. Let me look, look at my notes so I don't forget. Oh, also, you may have noticed that we didn't talk about reproductive rights legislation. We didn't talk about environmental legislation. There were a whole bunch of categories that we didn't talk about. So if you are interested in following any particular kind of legislation, if you are really concerned about the environment, if you're really concerned about a woman's right to choose oh, her own yeah. health care. Uh, How do you get to- um, Hang on one second. I'll answer questions in just one sec, if you don't mind. So um, if you if you have a subject that you really care about, you can focus on just that subject. You can follow one kind of legislation and be on our legislative action committee. So you can either get in touch with Mary Lindsay if you wanna join the legislative action committee. Um, You can also go on the website and sign up for it. Um, So get involved. We need some help tracking some of this other kind of legislation. Um, And I think that that, uh, maybe the only thing I wanted to talk about with regard to this. Um, I have some other brief things that we've learned not to talk about disinformation on social media because we learned that with our social media or our disinformation meeting recently. Um, but we also, the, the sort of the flip side of that is that we do need to be talking about what we want to have happen on social media. So as you learn about this legislation, as you learn about the things that we want to support, the things we don't want to support, if you are on social media, please post about that. Please make positive posts. This is what we want to do. Please share the League of Women Voters posts. As I said, I think they post every single day at the at the social media on the the, the Facebook, sorry. <laughs> we do, Anne, yes. I, thank you, I, thank you. I suddenly sound like <laughs> someone who's who was not born no, <laughs> social no, media no native. Worries. We do have a LinkedIn uh, account that we're ramping <laughs> up, but we're most active on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can find us there, mostly at 
LWVKC. If you have any problem with that, put in League of Women Voters Kansas City and we'll pop up. Please mm -hmm. follow us and share the posts. Yes, and we will um, we will make it as easy as possible for you to follow this legislation. We've got we're developing a form that you could just fill out once you followed it. Um, you could just fill out the form that gives us the very most pertinent information that we need um, and links to places where you know our members can do a deeper dive. Uh, so all that said, I am going to open the floor to questions. And I always like to start with a question to kind of see in it for everyone. So I have two, well, I have a couple of questions, but my first question is for Denise. Denise is the, is the John Lewis Voting Act and the Freedom to Vote Act, is it dead, dead, dead? Is there a chance that that might be resurrected, that that might have a shot someday? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have to continue to be optimistic, but but it does appear that um, these measures are not going to be in place to protect uh, voters against the assaults in 2022 for the 2022 elections. So, you know, but we we can't give up. I mean, they 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 told Martin Luther King that it would that there was no point in continuing to fight for the Voting Rights Act. Right. And he said hogwash. We're going to keep fighting for it. We're going to keep fighting for it. We know. I mean, it took more than a decade to get um, the Affordable Care Act. So this work is a marathon, not a sprint. And um, and I have to be convinced that that our continued vigilance will ultimately pay off. But in the short run, in terms of protecting of blocking these laws that are coming out right now in 2022, I think it's unlikely that these bills will will be in be able to be passed or be in place to stop the current assaults. And that's why I think we need to turn our attention to what's happening in the States. Okay. Thank you. Um, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, Lindsay, you have your hand up. Um, yes. I wanted to say uh, regarding testimony that, I mean, without a doubt, in-person testifying is the strongest statement that a person can make, but the next strongest is written, submitted, um, electronically submitted testimony, and it is easy to do. And you put that into the deep dive category, but actually in preparing for uh, today, I, I looked at a lot of bills and I read a lot of testimony and many of the online submitted testimony I mean, it hadn't occurred to me that were all these people who were writing like a one line testimony. I really oppose this because blah, 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 or I really support this, whatever. And so, um, I mean, it's really changed my thinking about how easy it would be um, and is, because I've done it now more, though I do more than one line. I mean, there's some people who just, you know, when you're giving testimony, you have to either click on, um, you are supporting it, you're opposing it, or you're just giving information. And, and there were plenty of people who just clicked either the oppose or the support and, um, and didn't even write anything. And I'm not suggesting that especially. I just, um, I just want people to know giving electronic testimony is, I think, the second and the gold standard is in-person testimony where you would really have, you know, testimony you work on, but um, this, you know, doing it electronically submitted is the next best thing. I think, oh, and I see Denise's head nodding. Mm -hmm. So Well, and Mary, um, can I ask, didn't you, didn't you kind of go into submitting testimony with the idea that it had to be kind of with formal written with formal language and that you had to have sort of sort of evidence like vetted evidence but then as you read through the testimony you started to realize that that lots of people submit testimony that's with a little bit more informal or, or less formal language more informal and and just that this is this is their opinion and that it can be not only shorter, but also less formal. Um, yes, that's true. I, I think my, I think the first real um, testimony that I have maybe ever given 
was uh, redistricting, and that was in person. And I really labored over that ahead of time. And I think everybody else um, did too, of the ones that I, um, you know, the hearings that I actually was present at. And, but now with, with the, you know, for the legislature, yeah, it's much, much easier. And I don't mean, you know, just say any stupid thing, but, um, but I, I'm not anymore going to be treating it as, well, I can't do it until I've really seriously done research on this and I have, you know, three solid reasons I'm for it or against it and all that. Um, and I know I've heard Denise say this a million times, but reading all of these, has kind of brought it to life to me that then giving your own personal angle on it, why you really support some legislation or oppose some legislation, if you give some personal reason that you are taking your position. And you can do it easily in this online submitted um, version. And and Denise, I know you're still here. So let me just say, um, you know, you do fantastic things on Mondays. I go to those virtually every Monday because it's just a shot in the arm for me to start my week with yep. your inspiration and enthusiasm. But one thing I'd suggest is let people know that doing the online testimony is, you know, is really pretty easy. And Anyway, that's all. That's all I have to say. Okay, I uh, I see hands up from uh, three people: Stacy, Evelyn, and Laura. So we'll get to that. I do want to address one thing about the testimony, which is um, you are certainly you are members of the League of Women Voters, so you are certainly welcome when you give testimony to mention that you're a member of the League of Women Voters. But I do want to caution you that. Um, uh, only they're only board members and actually even that's limited so um we don't speak on behalf of the league so that's a little bit different um because the the bar for you know whomever is speaking on behalf of the league is a little bit higher as far as how we you know the language that we use and the, and the research that we do but uh but feel free to include in your testimony that you are a member of the league um but just a little bit but don't not on behalf. And then I also Kelly Edmondson in the chat um, ask about uh, does it have to be personal impact? No, um, it doesn't. So that that question got answered, but I wanted to make sure that everybody heard that question and the answer that that no, it doesn't have to be personal. You, you don't have to tell a story about yourself. You can be a concerned citizen who would like to add your opinion. Um, so we'll go Stacy, then Evelyn, then Laura, then Alice. Stacy. Okay, just real quick, uh, Denise, is the um, coalition, is that a national uh, coalition? And if so, does every state have a chapter? This is the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. So this is, whoop, sorry, <laughs> my earbud just fell out. Uh, this is the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. So it is, it is um, limited to Missouri, but in it is the state table for Missouri. So what I will say is that other states have state tables and I've worked very closely with the state tables, for example, in Georgia, in North Carolina, in Texas and in other states. So other states do have state tables. Some of them are run through the state voices network. Some of them are not. Um, the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition um, grew out of uh, uh, state voices when it was originally here back in like 2006, but um, and then became its own sort of freestanding table as the voting rights issues continued to manifest even after they, they left the state. So the Voter Protection Coalition is not nationwide. The, uh, other states don't have Voter Protection Coalition by their name. No, they do. Like I said, other states have state tables. So um, just like Missouri does. So um, we do participate in um, a number of national um, coalitions that bring a lot of those state tables together, like the Strike Force Coalition, like the Lawyers Committee Election Protection Coalition. Um, but they, they look a little bit different in, in different states and not every state has a state table. 
Uh, and, and many of the state tables don't do everything that we do um, because ours includes, a, a, you know, is headed by an attorney that's a voting rights expert. Many of these state tables are more org just organizing vehicles and then they have to partner with legal organizations. Ours is a little bit, is a little unique because it's a little more integrated with the policy we, we do is with an eye towards what the law says and where the law is going around the country. And, it, and we sort of do our analysis and talking points and narrative building with an eye towards that um, kind of more wholesale look at how we advance through legislation, through litigation, through changing hearts and minds, public education. So I, I think, um, and, and that's one reason that that um, we've got a, a, a good reputation nationally, you know, amongst the other state table partners nationally is because of that integrated approach. But that that only is, is successful if all of us are in it together. And so that's the other thing that makes Missouri so uh, great is that so many groups participate. So many of the league, um, local leagues around the state participate and that's such a value added, I can't tell you. Um, so thank you all. Thanks. All right, Laura, I'm gonna jump to you because Evelyn just got up. <laughs> So, Laura, you're next. <laughs> Hi, trying to unmute. One of the things I can tell you is that um, our book group, we read books on women's issues, social justice, racial issues, et cetera. And fittingly enough, our book for um, February is One Person, No Vote. So if you want to have the background on why we're fighting so hard and what the frustration is, um, it's, it's a chilling reminder of voter suppression through the ages and why voter suppression is um, so practiced and so prevalent. Um, I do have a book bag with about seven more copies and I'll put it on my porch and put my, um, address in there if you want to try and get it or if you just want to try and find it online or on your Kindle. It's written by Carol Anderson, who also wrote White Rage. If you want a background on race issues in our country, white I would recommend White Rage hands down. Um, Carol Anderson is just, uh, she's um, PhD and um, writes a very readable and eloquent books about these very real issues. Um, you don't have to be a member of the book group to want to read this, but I just, uh, because of everything we've talked about today, it just shows you why the vote is so important and why voter suppression is so widespread and why it is a tactic. And I think we ought to acknowledge Judy, as Ansel has been putting in the chat, about how frustrating it is to keep trying to make a difference and wondering, are we making a difference? And um, I think Judy should speak to that because I, I totally feel her frustration. Well, it's just not just frustration. Thank you, Laura. Um, it's, it's a question of strategy. It's a question of you know thinking outside the box and thinking about what else possibly can work to turn this around. I mean, I mean, what I see is that the people who control the legislature don't represent us at all. And they don't listen to us because we don't vote for them. Um, they're from rural districts that are gerrymandered and um, they are beholden to the folks that live out there who for whatever reason, you know, support the ideas that they're, that they're pushing. And, you know, have been totally had, the, had their heads turned by all this scare stuff about critical race theory, et cetera, and you know, fraudulent voting and all of that kind of stuff. And you know, it just seems to me that until they start electing better representatives, these Republicans aren't going to change uh, because you know all they're really interested in is getting reelected. Well, and if so, you read another book, Democracy in Chains by I've Nancy McLean. I've read Democracy it. and Chains will give you the four decades of why now we have so many legislatures 
with very conservative far right people in power. This has been a concerted effort over four decades and they're, they realized that all politics is local and they got themselves locally elected and it's made a huge difference. And I do feel that there were a lot of people asleep at the wheel and thinking people can't possibly fall for this. And we got caught. So, so before we, I, I, I do want to go on to Evelyn and Alice so that we can get their questions. Can I just say something? I don't want to be a downer. I think that, you know, everybody should do what they want, they think is most effective. I just really am questioning, you know, the big picture stuff. Okay. Um, so I do want to move on in a minute, but I do, I would like to actually answer, you ask, ask a, a specific question, Judy, in the um, chat that you said, um, oh, it's, we've had a lot of chat, so let me go see if I can go back, but uh, you said, is there any evidence that any of this is working? I think that's a really good question, and I'm going to say, yes, there is absolutely evidence that this is working because this is how we got here, is that activists who were interested in conservative, in having a conservative culture, organized and got us to where we are now. So that's exactly, there was, there was organizing and there was work from conservative groups that got us here. And so the only way that, I mean, not the only way, but I, I think that's evidence that organizing at the grassroots level works. So they, there were other factors, of course, as well. They, there was lots of money and there are some, some things that make it difficult, but uh, I do think that there is some evidence that that getting ourselves organized works. Is it frustrating? Is it does it does it look like it's like a, it's a slog? Yeah, yeah. I see you shaking your head, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna we I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna go on to the other questions, and then I'm happy to stay on the the. Um, meeting as long as you'd like and anybody else who wants to kind of get it take a deeper dive on that would be welcome to um, but Evelyn I'm going to go to you next Evelyn do you have a question I, you're muted Evelyn thank you thank you uh, I wanted to um, thank Annette Lapique for her excellent presentation about the National Popular Vote Compact because uh, it demonstrated how the, the results of the electoral college are very damaging. And we have elected two recent presidents, the electoral college elected them rather than the popular vote. Now, Annette is part of the league state committee on the national popular vote compact. And every year they work very hard to get a representative or Senator in our Missouri legislature to propose a bill that would make Missouri a part, a state of that national popular vote compact. So be aware, uh, the league is in there, is in this marathon, okay? In this marathon to get the national popular vote compact actually working so it would displace the results of, we get enough states, you know, if we get enough states, their results would uh, be sent their popular vote results would be combined to perhaps overwhelm the electoral college results. It's just nearly, it, it just doesn't look possible to eliminate the national, the electoral college. Be aware right. the national league opposes the electoral college and, uh, and would work to replace it if we could. That's all. So thank you very much, Annette. And it's all a marathon. Yes. It is, yeah. Yep. Can, can I thank say you, something? Evelyn. Uh, sure. I think you're on mute though, Annette, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I, I, it's like anything. It might not happen in my lifetime in Missouri, but it is going to happen. We're only 75 votes short. There are some states that are much farther along in the legislative process, like They've had a hearing. They've had it passed by one, um, uh, uh, one uh, the House or the Senate, whatever. They're Chamber. waiting for uh, 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 the governor to sign the legislation. So it will happen our, in our lifetime. 
and we do have the opportunity to assist other states uh, with phone calling and stuff like that, you know, through the state. So I'll let people know about those. We worked on Virginia and got it passed, and that was that was huge. I mean, it it, it was as good as a victory here because it's the same amount of electoral college votes. So. And we were a part of that. So anyway, I just want to say that it, it's pretty, I mean, it feels hopeless sometimes, but we have made pro progress nationwide, yep. but it's a state deal. It has to be done for each state. So yep. that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Alice, did you have a question or a comment? A uh, comment uh, back to the House Bill 79 that is on a fast track and out of the House and first read in the Senate. Uh, that's really um, a top priority for many organizations. Jobs with Justice has a committee that is working on it. We, the league in Kansas City, have a person, Pat Bartholomew, who is on those calls on Tuesday at 10 o'clock strategizing on that. And Anne, if you would put in the uh, voter or someplace the toolkit that tells us uh, the talking points and basically uh, for your information, it's a power grab, and secondly, it's not partisan. It is not partisan at all. So check the toolkit if you're going to be testifying or sending uh, testimony or commenting or letter to the editor. It's good points and well done. Thank you. Thank you. Terry? Um, yeah. Um, on behalf of Observer Corps, we're working on Sunshine Week, which is the middle of March. And we are going to, Donna Hoke has arranged for um, Casey Lawrence, who's the director of the Sunshine Law Compliance at the office of the Missouri Attorney General uh, to come speak with us on uh, the Sunshine Law. And we're gonna be putting out um, publicity for that. The Observer Corps uh, will be inviting all of our election board officials and all of the uh, entities that we have observers at uh, to come and join us as well. And um, we will put it out and we invite you to invite many people um, to come learn about the Sunshine Law. I know there's at least three bills that haven't progressed in the legislature that um, are proposing to uh, limit um, the what can be asked for um, via the Sunshine Law. So, so Observer Corps is following that as well. Yeah, thank you for making that announcement. I have that on my list for the okay. first announcement. And I can you say the date again? It's March fourteenth from six to eight. And it'll, it'll be uh, live streamed to Facebook and we'll record it and put it on our YouTube channel. And the link for the, you can join the Zoom as well. And that link is yes, on the you calendar. Can. It is on and the it, calendar. It's on the calendar on our website. So yeah, yeah. thank you um, very much. Uh, all right, so I, it, it's 1130. So I'm, I'm gonna officially end our meeting and we'll, uh, we'll stop recording. And um, then I'm happy to stay on if we want to have a little bit more in-depth discussion about um, strategy, how to, you know, frustration, all that. Um, so, but first I want to say a ton of thank yous. Thank you so much to Pauline, who uh, does our programs and, and is the head of the program committee, puts these together and really makes it so that I don't have to do anything but show up with my little script. So thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Crystal, who does all the, the Zoom and Facebook and streaming and all the back end stuff, which is so awesome because again, I just have to show up with my script. And thank you to Judy Ann and the social media team who puts it all out there and makes all the graphics and uh, so that I get to just show up with my script. <laughs> and for today's uh, presentation, a, a special thank you to all the people who did all this research and went out and, and got all this information for us and brought it back. So uh, thank you so much to Mary Lindsay and to Rachel who put this group of people together and to Denise uh, for coming to share about what's going on with MOBPC, to Reva, to Annette, to Evelyn, and to all of you who show up because you care about this, because you want to make a change. So thank you to all of you for showing up. Uh, really appreciate it. And we are officially adjourned. And I'm going to stop the recording. And then we're going to
chit chat until we are uh, ready for lunch. <laughs> so thank you, everybody.